Okay, so good morning, everybody. And sorry for having a class in this hour of the day, but it was not our choice. Um, so today we'll try to have a, an introduction uh, about the meaning and the definition of human computer interaction. So we'll set the ground of the main uh, basic uh, uh, concepts that, of course, in the next weeks uh, we are going to dig uh, uh, deeper. Okay? So basically, what do, do we mean by human computer interaction? And uh, we try to see not the definition, but uh, some attributes, some, some properties of what uh, usability could mean. So it's a very wide uh, uh, concept uh, and uh, made of different facets, uh, and we want to start uh, looking at them. Hmm? This will also be useful for the lab that you are going to have uh, today, later on. Um, where we are going to ask you also to choose and to motivate some interfaces, uh, whether they are usable or not. Hmm? So that will be the task uh, in the lab of today. And uh, we'll also try to speak a bit, uh, but not too much, uh, about uh, design processes. So uh, you know that uh, software engineering is all about processes, about uh, what are the steps for delivering a successful uh, product. Uh, so one question, one legitimate question was, uh, Okay, but in those processes, where do the HCI, where do the usability design takes place? So how can we integrate the usability into a software design process? Hmm? Um, but we won't spend uh, too much time on that. Uh, basically, uh, we are trying to use the term uh, usability or human computer interaction as a shorthand uh, for a wide set of, uh, of disciplines that are related to each other, okay? Um, we have uh, all the uh, issues about uh, the devices that users use to interact uh, with the computer system. Mm -hmm. uh, and so all the design of user interfaces and all the design, overall design of an interactive system, just don't think just uh, about a computer or a web uh, uh, application, okay? Think of any, any device. Think of the, the, no, the machine that you, where you go to load your uh, GTT card, okay? That's a computer system that has an interface. Hmm? It's a very ugly box. Uh, we have the very strange interface. Nevertheless, somebody designed that, okay? It's an interactive system with a design for its interface. You may like it or not. Um, and so there are all the topics about how to build these devices, how to build these interfaces, and there's also the, the research about new devices, okay? So you have grown up uh, with uh, touch as one of the main interaction methods. Okay, most of the time when you're interacting with a computer, you're using touch on your smartphone or on your trackpad, okay? This is quite recent, okay? So... Uh, 15, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, the only way, uh, place where you could use touch uh, was on the Nintendo, okay? With the stick, not with your fingers. So technology didn't exist uh, uh, at that time, and it's quite recent compared to the mouse, compared to the keyboard hmm, that goes back 60 years. Hmm? And, and so uh, every now and then a new you know, interface modality comes out, a new type of device, and we need to rethink uh, the modality of interaction according to the capabilities of the new devices. Uh, another area where um, ACI comes into place uh, uh, is uh, the physical aspect. We are, we are not going to touch this, okay? But uh, the way you are sitting in your desk, uh, the space, the size, the inclination of the desk, uh, and so on, uh, is a part of usability design. Somebody should have designed uh, those seats uh, with uh, comfortability in mind, uh, so that you could sit properly and in a comfortable way, and uh, you could have, I wouldn't, say, I wouldn't say enjoy, because we are here to study, but uh, at least uh, uh, don't have any bad experience uh, with that physical object. So there's a whole field of uh, ergonomics and unit factors that deals with uh, how people interact with the physical objects or utilities in their physical space. This is very important in the industry uh, market, for example, 
when you have um, workers uh, uh, using machines uh, uh, on the floor shop and so on, and it's very important that the spaces and the, and the strengths and the positions uh, are, are carefully designed. Hmm? Uh, just think of a, of a car seat. When you sit in the car, you have, uh, not my car, but uh, uh, in fancy cars, you have um, dozens of controls about uh, how, how to you know, fit uh, the ergonomics uh, of the car uh, to your body or your, to your preferences. Okay, so there's a whole field that it's more mm, basically in uh, mechanical research, uh, mechanical engineers study this, this kind of stuff, which is somewhat related uh, to usability. And then we have the more properly, say, computer science aspects. Uh, we called it uh, human computer interaction because we are in computer science, uh, but a more general definition would be. HMI, human machine interaction, if you are speaking with a friend that does uh, mechanical engineering or automatic engineering, they will call them HMI. So all the dashboard in the car are part of the system that they call human uh, machine interface. Um, there's a MMI also main machine interaction or interface. This term is not used uh, much more because it has the main word. And you know that whenever you say man without saying woman in the same sentence, you are a very bad person. And um, so they, they, they prefer to use human. Hmm? OK. Um, and so these are more the areas we are dealing with that are on the borderline between psychology and technology. OK. Uh, in order to interface, I don't know, with a with a video display, if you are building an interface to a VGA screen, VGA screen, you need to know the signals for this cable. You need to know what's on the other side of the cable. Okay? And this is the same here. On the other side of the interface, we have the user, the human. So we need at least to understand how the humans work in order to be able to program them or program behaviors that would, they would use. Hmm? Um, and so, is in uh, human-computer interaction, it's very easy to say that we have two main ingredients uh, that are the users, or each user. Uh, I would say each user because each user is a different person and may have different preferences, may have different skills. So it's not a just a, a big magma of users okay, out there are many individual people, each one is a user hmm, of our system, and we should be able to serve all, them all. And of course, we have the computer. It's our job to make it work. And the two, these two interact. But they don't interact uh, at random. The computer, or the, basically we are focusing on the interface of the application, enables the user to accomplish a task. OK, so this is the key point. We are not talking about uh, clicking a button. We are not talking about uh, browsing a page or whatever. These are low-level actions, something that we need to design, we need to implement. But it's not the reason why the users open your application. I'm opening the website of the Polytechnico because I want to uh, book for the next uh, lecture. That is my goal. I know that this, that goal implies one or more tasks to be performed. Okay, and uh, at the end, when I receive the confirmation that I've been booked for today's class, uh, my task is finished. It's over. Okay, so when users approach technology, they do that uh, for getting a result. Uh, for themselves. So let's try always to make the effort of seeing the same, let's say, uh, interface, the same software that you are developing, not from the point of view of the software developer, but from the point of view of the user. Why is the user using these uh, buttons, these screens, uh, these forms? Because the user need to do, need to reach a given result. Okay. And this is not a single page. 
usually a task is composed of several different steps. And the user should be guided throughout these steps by the interface in order to reach the result easily with low effort and without errors, possibly. Okay? Error, I don't think, I don't, I'm not uh, speaking about programming errors, but interaction errors. Okay, I, I clicked, I enrolled, oh dear, I enrolled to the wrong course uh, because they were so close, for example. Um, so we, mm, we must learn to build, to design the interactions of the user with the computer to accomplish tasks that are of interest to the user. Okay? These tasks are similar, if you already uh, heard the term, to the user stories no, that we use in the, in the agile development uh, methodologies. So uh, um, self-contained activities that lead to a result that is useful for the user. Okay? And uh, in this, a computer system should aim and usability, usability at least contains the, these three big dimensions. A system should be useful. Okay, even a video game is useful because you have fun with it. Or a procedure for, you know, paying the taxes. It's something that is painful, but it's useful because you have to do it and they complete it. Okay, so it should accomplish some task that is useful to the user, always, sorry. I, for every sentence I'm saying, I need to append, or at least mentally, we should append also this uh, uh, detail. Hmm? Usable means easy to use. Okay, maybe it's useful because it accomplished a good task, uh, a good result, something that I need to do or something that I want to do, but it, in doing that, uh, it may be more or less difficult more or less cumbersome, okay? Uh, and this is where, the first point, uh, where uh, it's important to get uh, the needs of the user. I build a system where you can do something that you really want to do. It could be the system that is completely useless. Very nice, but no user is going to use it because they, they don't need it, okay? Uh, and then the second step is uh, once they know what the user wants, uh, then make it uh, in a way that it will be easy to use. And finally, the combination of the two hopefully make a system to be used actually, really, by people, not just being designed and sitting, sitting there or being used only by force because you have to do it, huh? but people want to use it. Hmm? Uh, if you think about these three attributes, uh, uh, they had a very strong push with the <clears throat> all the world of the mobile applications. Whereas the very, there's a very competitive market, you have uh, hundreds of thousands of different applications, and you choose, you just install and choose the ones that do something that you want, and they do it easier. Otherwise, you just uninstall them and seek for another one. So the, the key to the success in the mobile world, for example, is uh, having something which is really useful for some people, hmm? maybe tracking your steps or, or uh, sports or friends or whatever, because some population of the users want to do that. Not every person in the world want the same things or need the same things. Some group of users have a specific need, and they build an application for satisfying that need, and they build it in a way that is easy and fun to use. Okay? Uh, this should be the driving force in our design, in the conception of our system and in the design of our systems. Okay? Then there's all the rest that you know, bug-free, uh, performance, compatibility, whatever from the engineering point of view we want. But if you are building the perfect system that has no bug whatsoever, with extra performance or whatever, but it's not used by anyone, 
because it doesn't solve a real problem. And what it does, it's clumsy to operate. You, you, we did, uh, we would do a very sad exercise. And of course, these two in main ingredients that have to interact have their own structure, have their own uh, peripherals. Human ones, uh, you know, humans uh, can interact with the system through their sensory system, so their sight, their sense of hearing, their sense of touch, and uh, uh, can provide in information to the system, provide inputs uh, through their movements, uh, the hands uh, that move the mouse, that, that press the keys, uh, that swipe on a surface, and so on, voice, uh, in some cases, the, you know, with all the uh, game consoles, you have a lot of games where you are interacting with your posture, with your mov uh, movements, hmm? in front of a camera, for example. And so, this is quite, Okay, there's a, a lot of, you know, study in these areas. Uh, we are not going to do, go deep into this part, uh, but at least we should uh, uh, spend some minutes uh, in uh, discussing about how all these input and, inputs and outputs of the human body are processed by the human brain. Okay, um, very simply. Uh, because uh, we need to design the computer system in order to drive the cognition of the user to understand what we are doing, or vice versa, <clears throat> to enable the user to find where in the, in the interface is, is to be found the actions that he's going to, to search. Okay, about computer, we already know everything. Oh, uh, we are. You know, technology nerds, so it's not uh, worth mentioning. But uh, the input-output uh, interfaces are designed to match with each other. So I am designing a keyboard so that a user can press the keys, not just for fun or for the pleasure of the computer itself. The computer doesn't care about peripherals. So with these peripherals, they, we enable the user to communicate with the computer but this communication, of course, is not ideal. It has some limitations. So we should work with, within these limitations. So it's not like I can speak to a computer like I'm speaking with you. It's much less intuitive, it's much less natural. So we must build the natural modes of interactions within the limitations of the input-output systems. And the perfect user interface is the one that you don't feel. You feel with your brain that you are connected to the information. You don't feel that, you don't think that you now, okay, now I must swipe or I must read in the corner because there's something that is interesting to read. You just use the interface and oh, like going on the bike. You don't think about uh, pushing the right leg and then the left one and then the right one again, okay? You just bike, you just drive. You're thinking about where you're going, not the movements, uh, the low level movements, the detailed movements uh, of interacting with your, with your bicycle. And the same here. A good interface is one that it, it's, it isn't felt by the user. You don't perceive that you're using interface, uh, it just becomes part of your muscle memory and of course, it's not by chance, it's by design. We should design so that it, this happens. So in all the disciplines that are interacting in some way, in uh, human-computer interactions that go from psychology to ergonomics uh, to interaction between people, so sociology, uh, and also the business parts that, of course, a good design is also linked to the, to the market success of an application and so on, of course, we are going to to focus more on the computer engineering part. So on, on building a computer system that uh, has the properties that we want, okay? From the usability point of view. And uh, uh, we need to bring in into our you know, design knowledge uh, some uh, tools. Okay, you are not 
learning a programming language as a tool, we are not learning a debugger as a tool, but we are learning some methods, some methodologies that will help us in the design. So it's not magic, it's not that you just know how to build interfaces. There are rules, there are methods, there are ways to discover what the user wants, there are ways to discover which interactions of the user are successful, uh, successful and which are great problems or issues, and so on. So we are going to learn these, some of these techniques. Okay, there's a 30 years literature on that. We, are, we try to select something that is practically applicable to our kind of designs. Uh, we see that there are methods that are si simple enough, uh, but they provide us uh, a lot of information to avoid uh, that kind of ugly interfaces that we just showed you in the, one of the first slides yesterday. Hmm? Um, so this is the content, the technical content that we'll de develop during the weeks uh, that will help us to reach this goal. It's only a, a small part of all the knowledge that is needed, but we selected, say, the subset that should fit our, our needs. Okay, so talking about interaction, which is the, the ground on which uh, we are building everything else. Um, we start always with the user. The user wants uh, to accomplish some goal, one or more goals. So this is the starting point. If we don't know who the user is, or we don't know what does he want to do, we could stop here. There's no sense in writing a line of code or anything else until we know who is my user and what does he want to do? Not what do I want them to do, what they want to do, what they need to do, what they wish to do. There's different nuances, but it's always something in the mind of the user. Okay? Only then I can start thinking about the tasks, the sequence of steps that they can provide to the user so that they can accomplish their goals. And the knowledge of the user is uh, also uh, affected by the domain in which they are working. Is my user a programmer? Is my user a chemical engineer? Is my user a cleaning lady? Is my user a cook, a gardener? Um, a bus driver, a car driver. We are also car drivers. So we are users of those interfaces. Every domain of application, every job type, brings on their own domain information. So if I'm driving a bus, I have something to do with gears, I have something to do with doors, we have something to do with the stops that they have to do, with the path, with the schedule that they're always late, and so on. Those are the concepts that the user, that type of, those types of users, have in mind when they're doing their, their job. And there are very specific goals that are related to the domain. So the first step for us to, we, would, should be to be familiar with the domain in which the users operate. We should learn out how they think. What are the problems? What are the goals? What are the daily activities? It's easy if you are designing a system with a student as a target user, because you are students. More or less, you know what the students want. No. You know what the student from Polytechnic want. No. You know this for the student from computer engineering at the Polytechnic want. Because maybe uh, a student uh, of, uh, of piano in the music conservatory would have a very different perception of the procedures that he needs to do or the, uh, the way in which the teaching is organized, for example. So don't try to generalize your own personal experience by saying everybody wants this. No, you want this, and the users that are in the same narrow domain as you 
maybe they want the same. But never pretend you understand what another person wants or needs. This is the first mistake. Oh, I know what you need. No, you don't. Yes, but no. I could imagine, no. Huh? There will be the first step, the first week, next week we'll work on need finding. So techniques for understanding what they really need, not what I think they need. Okay? They, the users, not their bosses or their colleagues. Okay, so the first, uh, the most important part is here. Uh, we, and it's something that you need to work on your project uh, uh, proposal. The project proposal actually asks you who are the target users and what are their needs uh, that you are trying to solve. I know, I understand features. We are not discussing yet about what the system will do, what features we need to implement, uh, what elements we have in the interface. Not yet. First, we need to understand the problem, the goal, the problem they want to solve. Okay? And then we, in the design process, we have to decompose this, these goals into tasks. So, so sequences of operations that may be used to reach the goal. So the goal is something that the user has in mind, a need, a desire. A task is a set of steps that I am designing through which the user, if, if he goes through these steps, uh, they can reach their goal, that specific goal. Of course, if they have a second goal, there will be a, a different se sequence of, of steps, a different task that they can accomplish. So this is the first difference between what I have in mind and what is the actions that I need to perform to get there. Um, and, the, and this is where the design comes into place. We are building that, okay? But we should, should always be, when I develop an application, it's easy, okay, I have some data in a database, so I need to insert, uh, create some data, uh, modify, delete, uh, sort, uh, or whatever, okay? So it's very tempting for us to build an interface to expose those basic operations to the user. But, mm, okay, these are basic operations, but they don't compose themselves into a task that serves a higher, uh, higher goal. Okay? Mm, well, I know this sentence is quite general at the moment. Uh, we are working on that in the next weeks. Hmm? Um, and the problem is, uh, the same as a person, it's worse than person-to-person -person communication, okay? If you are trying to communicate with another person in front of you, hmm, I'm not making uh, house and wife, and wife jokes because uh, we would never end, but uh, each one of you has something in their mind that the other cannot see. You can only guess what is in the other's mind by interacting with them, by communicating with them, by exchanging information with them. So I am building a model in my mind of what you have in your mind. On what? Okay, now go, let's go to computers. Uh, the, the application has some internal state. It doesn't have a mind. The application has some internal state. It has some information about me, it has some information about our interaction. Okay? When I'm interacting with a computer, I am building a mental model in my mind of what the comp computer is, is knowing at the moment and how it's working. And I build this model without thinking about it, but just, I, you feel it when you, when you are using some a device, uh, maybe with some controls, uh, at the point you, you get it. Okay, I understood how it works. Okay? Because now, in your mind, you have a sort of, of simulator, a model that, dis that describes how it works. Okay? And so you expect, at that point, you know, if I want, you know, to, to raise the volume level, I have to act on that specific control. Because I have in mind, maybe some chain of uh, amplifiers that we will be controlled uh, 
by some given controls or whatever. Mm -hmm. So the problem is uh, that the interface should be powerful enough to let the user build the correct mental model about the system. About the state of the system, basically, what the system is doing. And so the system should be able to push its own state to the user through some interface, screen elements, information. The state should be visible to the user in some way. And the operations that the system allows to do on the state, on its state, should be easy to find for the user. So if I can delete an element, which is a state modification that the system allows, the user should understand, first, that he can delete this element, and second, how to do it. What is the action to do it? Maybe for deleting the element, you need to swipe left and, and top while it's shaking, okay? It will be an action, but the user will not find it. So the user, the system is not uh, telling the user how to operate it, how to access the information. Uh, in, when you are, we are programming, uh, we are uh, speaking the language of the computer. The data, the concept, you know, your classes in, your, uh, in our UML models, the name of the tables, the name of the programming modules, and so on. But uh, when we show information to the user, we should speak the language of the user which is uh, the language of the domain. Okay. So, for example, we are not saying, uh, I will insert you in the table of uh, uh, reservations for today's class. Insert into a table is not something that the user feels that he wants to do. I will enroll you into the class. Because enrolling, or booking, or whatever term you want to use, is something that belongs to the domain of the user. So every message, every label, every button should speak in the language of the user. So use the terms of the application domain, should point the user to the problem that he wants to solve, to the goals that he wants to achieve. And so there is a mismatch. We, I have my mental model, you have your state. I have my language, the task language, the user language, the domain language, and it has uh, its own language, the core language, the system language. The interface design should work uh, around uh, these differences and should try to, try to bridge these two words together in something which is, as we mentioned before, seamless enough that you don't feel the interface while you're using that. Mm -hmm. So, in pictures, Donna Norman developed this very simple model, but it's easy to understand, and it survives basically until today, even if the other researchers try to make it more complex, add details, but the basic point is here. So we have a system, a computer system, any, with some interfaces, input and output interfaces, that needs to interact with some user. So I draw them, Norman drew them apart. They are far from each other, they're separate, okay? Until we are implanting computer in the mind, they're separate. And so there are two flows of information. One is the evaluation from the system outputs to the user. So the user is in front of the interface and he's trying to evaluate what the interface is trying to tell him. And this evaluation contains information and actions, possible actions. You open a website, you see some information, you get some information, and at the same time, while your eyes are parsing the interface, you understand, or you guess at least, what is the action that you can do on that page? Where can you click? Where can you type? Where can you swipe? Where can you scroll? 
Mm? So you are understanding the outputs of the system, both in terms of knowledge about the state itself and knowledge about how the interface works. Okay. And the second direction is the execution, when the user is actually interacting with the system, usually giving comments, is pushing buttons, is typing text, is clicking somewhere, using the input capability of the system, or is speaking, for example, in, with Alexa. There's a very narrow evaluation because it only talks sound, doesn't show itself, but you can speak and give orders. And from the response, you can guess whether your order was correctly understood or not. In most of the cases, it isn't. OK, so we are stuck in this loop forever. Every time I just imagine a web application, it's easy to understand. You have a screen. You, understand, you perceive what is on the screen. You get some information. You know what actions you can do on the screen. You perform one of these actions. Normally, performing some action will change the internal state of the system. And as a consequence, the system will also change its output, its interface. If I'm doing something, I expect something to change. And I expect what has changed to be consistent with the, the meaning of the action that I did. OK, if it, we have a button with uh, Duplicate written on it, uh, I, if I click on duplicate, I expect something to be duplicated, to show twice, OK? I expect uh, that the system will show the result of my action. Uh, in that way, with this interaction, it's, it's, it's how I build uh, my mental model of the system, how the system works, what information it has, because it shows me some pieces here and there and what operations they can do on these pieces of information. Because these operations are the parts of the user interface. And as I go along, I can predict what I will do, what will happen when I do some action, okay? So we have this loop where no, no, the user first knows what he wants to do. I want to enroll. And then, and this is the, the first goal that has nothing to do with the computer or with the interface. Then the user needs to translate uh, his own goal into some plan to plan these actions. And so, how do I do that? With the app, with the website, on this action, on this, on this interface, and so on. So in, I know that I need to start some procedure or some action on the computer system to get to my goal. Hmm? Of course, performing this intention, as Norman calls it, I need to have an understanding of the task I need to accomplish. So it should be also be easy to understand and to predict. And this task is made of a sequence of actions. And then I finally execute this action. So when I click on a button, I am clicking on that button because I know that that button is part of a sequence of actions that I understand that will lead me to my goal. Everything happens in a split second in our brain, of course. We are translating, I want to get there, the goal, into, OK, to get there, I need three more steps. Or at least I need the first step in this direction. And third, OK, for doing a step in that direction, I need to click that button. Finally, I click it. But we are also translating from goal to intention to action in our mind. And hopefully, at every step we do, we are one step closer to the goal. So every trivial action always has in mind, in our mind, we always have the goal in mind. The final goal. And so we do this action, like the click in the button, the system will react, and we will uh, immediately, hopefully, perceive that something has changed. There's nothing more frustrating than clicking on a button and nothing happens. Okay? So first of all, we should uh, perceive 
with our senses, just, just with the sight or the hearing, that something has changed. And then we can interpret what has changed. And we can, at that point, uh, double check what had actually changed in the interface with what we expected to change. That was the reason why we did this action. And finally, we are ev evaluating. So from the, uh, the, 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 the difference on the screen, on the interface, we can update our understanding of the system state. So we are here as a user, and we are trying, just by operating the interface, we are building a model of how the system works and what are the information uh, that the system has about, uh, about my task. So these two uh, exchanges of information, uh, they were called uh, gulfs by, by normal, okay? The gulf is something that keeps separate the two coast lines on the two sides. And we must cross these two gulfs, execution and evaluation, many times a day. Uh, and hopefully, the, the goal of the inter user interface is, is make, making these gulfs as narrow as possible, hmm? as painless as possible. OK, these are the original pictures by Norman, but just for historical reasons. Um, the same picture can be drawn by extracting the input and output of the interface uh, and making them stand out from the picture. Why? Because this is the actual part that we are designing. We as designers are focused on what happens in the, on the user interface on the input and output elements. So these are actually part of the system, but they are directly in contact with the user. Hmm? So this is the, actually the, the, the same picture as before. And uh, these other researchers try to give also some names uh, to the different parts. Uh, for example, in the evaluation, first the system should present information on the interface, and then the user should observe those. These are two different steps. Of course, as a designer, we are responsible for this. The presentation layer of our application. The goal is to create an output that will be observed and understood easily by the user. So actually, we are programming two different uh, systems. We are programming our system to show some interface, but this will be also used to program some information into the user's mind. And the same on the, uh, on the reverse, uh, the act uh, of inter interacting with the system inputs, with the interface, is called articulation. I'm articulating an action. Mm -hmm. Strange words. And uh, when the system, the interface, receives uh, a command, it will perform it. When I enter some data, when I move some object, uh, the system will uh, receive this user action, articulation, and perform something inside the system state. We don't need to learn these words. We are not going to use them so much. But just showing that these two parts, presentation and performance, are programming. Is what we need to program. But the real goal is to understand what the user is trying to do and giving, I would call it programming the user, right? I'm not ashamed of that. I want that the user thinks something, and I want to drive what the user is thinking. Hmm? Um, there are some errors. There may be some errors. Hmm? We call them human errors in the execution in the gulf of execution, OK? So the user may do something wrong. 
and uh, we, can, we can't ignore that. It should be part of our design, knowing that the user may do something wrong. Actually, let me go to this asterisk, uh, it's not the fault of the user. Okay. An error is an objective action, something that should have been A and instead it was B. But a human error is never to blame on the user. Okay, every night before going to sleep, uh, always repeat, okay, your, with, along with your prayers also, the user is never wrong. It's never the fault of the user. If the user makes something, makes an error, the fault is with the interface. The fault is with the system. The responsibility is of the system, is never of the user. Okay? Uh, the fault of a user are usually the result of a bad design. How many times uh, did you feel stupid in front of a door and you didn't know where to push or where to pull or where to slide, whether to slide? Or you, feel, you felt stupid in front of a, of a faucet for opening the water. Do I need to slide a lift? Do I need to rotate? Do I need to push? Do I need to uh, move? No. We always feel stupid because they have a bad design. And design is not looking nice. It's not aesthetics. It's functionality. If you talk with your, with your colleagues that are studying design in the architecture faculty, they will tell you that. Design is not art, it's function. And uh, every time, so keep in mind, every time something is difficult to use, you are not stupid. The designer of that object, or we hope it was stupid because otherwise it was evil. Huh? Evil. It was trying to make you bad. Hmm? So users are humans. And humans are not machines. They are imprecise. Uh, they can be distracted. Uh, uh, they can be in a hurry. They can maybe don't see very well because there's a flash of light that, that may happen. OK, but it's something that we should take into account in our system design, we should anticipate that the user may be wrong. Hmm? Uh, how? Well, we should minimize the chance of uh, inappropriate actions. So we should uh, avoid all the possibilities where the user thinks uh, that some action as a result uh, and uh, uh, wh while it it does something completely different. So in the evaluation, the user understands that for going forward on the next step, I need to do this. And actually, you don't. You, you, do, you need to do something else. OK? For example, uh, if you have a close button and a cancel button, which is doing what? Stupid. Because we are creating evaluation problem, the user is not clearly shown what these two buttons do. What is the difference between the two? And so it's just natural that it may sometimes choose the wrong one. Choose the wrong one because they were wrongly labeled. Hmm? Um, when, at the end, when the user is doing something wrong, we should always be careful not to do, to, not to make anything irreversible. So I made a mistake. Okay, so what? Go back and correct it. Well, first, maybe realize that you, do, you made some mistake, and then you can go back and correct it. An interface that doesn't let you go back again is uh, an evil interface. You need to get it right the first time. Huh? No. And, uh, uh, okay, and everything boils down again to being very clear about the state of the system and presenting it to the user. And by the way, talking about human errors, there are two very broad categories of what may, may go wrong when the user interacts with the system. The first ones are slips. A slips 
A slip is a type of, of uh, human error where only the execution was wrong. Very stupid uh, example. I have two buttons. I click on the right one instead of the left one because they were so close and they were so small. Hmm? And uh, so I know that I need to click on the left one, but my fingers just clicked on the, on the other one. Because, because of many reasons, we don't care. It may happen, okay? You knew that was the right one, but your execution was not per perfect. Um, this, in many cases, uh, is very easy to correct. If you find that your users are doing these kind of slips, maybe it's a problem of size, maybe it's a problem of spacing, maybe it's a problem of layout, uh, that can be quite easily corrected. Hmm? Or, because the user knew what was the right action. Or, mistakes are when the user thought or misunderstood the meaning of an action. Hmm? This is more complex. So the user was convinced that that was the right button to press, but it wasn't. Because the users had in mind that that button would cause some result, but it doesn't. In this case, there's a miscommunication between the system and the user. The system is not, it's an evaluation problem at this point. The system is telling the user something and the user is understanding something else. So the blame, of course, is of the system that doesn't tell this information in the way the user could understand it clearly. For example, if we have this uh, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, um, looking glass uh, um, icon, it may be used for zoom or it may be used for search, for example. And if there is no context around this icon, the user may have in mind, okay, I want to zoom and click there, and instead it will open the search window. Because there's not enough information for the user to understand correctly what the system is trying to tell. If you have this with the plus and minus buttons, then it's of course it will be a zoom. If you have it on, on the side of a text uh, or a small text area where the user can type something, of course it's search. So you just need uh, small hints to drive the user mind into the correct understanding. So it's not always as easy as this, but we must, uh, in a way, understand how the user is perceiving things, how the user is, is evaluating these interfaces, and is made of uh, some, let's say, uh, automatic methods in our mind, uh, and a lot of conventions that the user has learned throughout the years. And we should exploit those to make the evaluation easier or more foolproof. Um, I'm sure you felt this uh, situation many, many times. For example, when you, yeah? Uh, if, uh, even in the case, does it follow a certain convention? Yeah. So, for create button on the left with respect to the counter button, and the user um, used to click uh, create button on the right. Yeah. Is this a developer's fault or the Okay, so the question was, uh, uh, if the some inter interface is not following some general conventions, like for example the cancel and OK button in a given order, okay, and so the user interface uses switches the button. The fault is with the programmer always, uh, because I didn't take into account that the user uh, uh, learned and expected a convention. And then I'm not applying that. So if you break some convention, you must be very, very careful. Okay? Um, a convention, we will come to that when we discuss about visual design and, some, and stuff like that, is not a limitation. It's just uh, 
exploiting years and years of learning of your users. We know that these doors with the red bar handle are meant to be pushed. Okay? If you are designing a door with a red bar that is supposed to be pulled, it's a design mistake. Ah, oh, but it's nicer, but it's, uh, it's innovative, it's different. Who cares? You are betraying your users. You are telling them, okay, this looks like this, but it isn't. If you are building an escape room, that's fine. If you're building a usable interface, no. Okay, so conventions are very, very slow to change. Yeah. You are going to follow, so if the user is, uh, if your application is, uh, offered to group of users with different conventions, you should follow the users. You should follow the users, meaning uh, uh, you should offer different interfaces to different uh, group of people. It should be customizable, should be adapted to the users. Is it access work? Yes. But our goal is to make the application usable, not to reduce the work. Hmm? Um, okay, just a very, this very short story. Uh, this is a, an actual picture. No, I, I know everybody's familiar with you. When you're home and you have maybe three light switches on the wall, I bet uh, you don't get the right one at the first time. Hmm? Even you. Nobody, nobody does. Even if you're living in the same house since 20 years, uh, you always get it wrong. Okay, our mind is not made for that in kind of interface, but it sticks. Okay, it sticks, but it stinks also. But okay, uh, this is a, was a, a picture from a very futuristic house. I took this picture, I will never tell you where. Um, all this ha house is uh, automated. There was windows, doors, lights, everything is, uh, it was a smart home. Uh, with all, every, they had a lot of money, they, they, they threw in a lot of technology. And so, besides each, each door, there was something like this. So every door in the house, you have something like this. Three blocks of switches. In vertical. So, my mind is first thinking, but why is it vertical? Normally, I see them like the, look, look there in a horizontal. They are exactly the same. There should be a reason. This is how our, 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 our mind works. If something is different, there should be a reason. And two of them are gray and one is red. So the red one should be different in some way, should have a different category, different properties. It turned out that there was no reason either for the orientation or for the color. The color was just put them at random. The, the guy who did the installation just as a, as the bag of, uh, of plaques and that put them randomly. And the uh, vertical, I, I never understood why. And then there were all these witches that are all black. And so people really, when they're saying, okay, which is the button to open the door that they have in front? which is the one to switch the light off from the room I'm leaving or, and to switch the light on from the room, or in the room that I'm going to. Who knows? Let's try. And so people didn't feel in control of that smart house. They felt trapped inside something that you cannot control. You don't know what happens. And sometimes you are also afraid of pushing a button because maybe you are opening the front door and you don't realize it. So the system didn't tell the user what to expect for the various actions and therefore the user, some actions were also dangerous, opening the front door, for example, 
or going dark in your room and then you don't see any, anything more uh, any longer and so the user will will be afraid of trying out the options okay it's a worst case scenario the story goes on that uh, then the, uh, the users complained and so the installer put some icons besides all these buttons and these icons were if possible even more confusing hmm? because we had Two icons here, one would be open the door and the other would be close the door. I bet that if, if you are betting which one is open and which one is closed, we will get 50-50, okay? Because actually, I, I can find the logic. This sign here was something like control a group of lights. It seems like an alien uh, uh, symbol from the science fiction movies, probably. This is opening and closing a sliding door. It's very hard because we are the door with a left arrow and a right arrow and then this icon should relate to the left half of this button and the right icon should be uh, referred to the right half of the button and so I always ask myself why isn't this icon here and this other there I the user needs to do three or four mental steps before understanding which button to use first the door does it open on the right or on the left? Okay, on the right. Okay, so the right is here, and this icon, this icon is on the right, and so it should be in this part. Every time you go into a door. So the, the final result was that the people used just some scotch tape by writing, don't touch this, and uh, because the user are building workarounds. If some interface is difficult to use, the users will, will build workarounds. And this, of course, defeats all the purpose of your system because it will not use some features, it will use another complex workaround because it fits more with their mental model. And this uh, example fits perfectly with this definition of usability by Steve Krauss. This is a book. Uh, unfortunately, they don't, they don't sell it anymore. Uh, don't make me think which is, I think, the most synthetic way of expressing usability. The user should not be required to think about what he's doing. It should come to them immediately, without effort. Uh, there are some, I think you are very familiar with this window, the font settings in Word, in Microsoft Word. It contains some serious issues uh, we are about conventions we are able to parse this window with the meaning of the windows very quickly we know which are the elements where we can choose an element we know which are the elements where we can type something because it's all part of a typographical convention so of windows form basically we know where so for example here we have just to select with font underlined, and in the font name we could select from the drop down or type something there. We don't need a course for understanding that. But then there are some errors. For example, don't read this. Imagine it's written in uh, you know, a language that you don't know, Japanese. Probably there are no Japanese here. So, from the interface, you get that you have four checkboxes. And from the interface, you get that these four checkboxes are independent from each other. In fact, they are not. And if you understand the, the meaning, the first two are mutually exclusive, and the second and third and the fourth one are mutually exclusive. So a design where we have four flat checkboxes in a row doesn't tell us that there are actually two groups. And these groups are, and inside each group you can only select one. So there's some information that the interface could give but it doesn't give. And it leaves to the user for experimentation or for understanding of the text here. We don't notice this because it's years and years that but if you, if, you were to if you happen to see an interface like this, 
less familiar, less frequent, with terms that you don't fully understand, then we, you, you will be led into misunderstanding. You will expect to be able to, to select all four of them. At the end, you can't. Okay, so the mental model that you're building before interacting, before trying to click, it will be wrong and you have to adjust it after you click on something and say, okay, it doesn't work like this. Hmm? Guys from Microsoft, of course, know that. Hmm? They chose this because of compactness, because probably, probably it was not so frequent to be able to choose this and so on. So they made very advanced, to say, careful decisions. Hmm? They broke some convention, but with reason. They did some studies and probably they had, oh, uh, we are engineers, we have to work with compromises, with trade-offs. So at one point, uh, one decision should, one say, need uh, should take over another. Okay, so basically what we have here is uh, we have all the visual design tools, the tool is the, the buttons and so on, that will help us to build uh, these interfaces for easy evaluation and to build these interfaces for easy execution. So we know, we expect, to, we are able, we know how, how to program this. The problem that we are trying to face is what is, sorry, uh, what is the best way to exploit these, let's say, low level features for building the interface. Um, of course, uh, we are talking about uh, windows and forms and web applications, but uh, the same concept will apply to any kind of design framework. For example, on, on mobile, we have a completely different set of widgets and of behaviors. We have all this, the swiping that uh, is not, uh, and uh, the vibration that is not available on desktop. So every application domain has a different set of input and output elements. Okay, uh, we should be able to, to adapt of them. And uh, um, all this information, in a way, uh, we, we should find some ways uh, to, to guide us, to help us through the design process, okay? Um, thanks to because uh, all the, the low-level information of the example we saw is just something that to build up our awareness, basically. Then we need to turn this awareness into some design method, okay? So there are design methods that uh, help us during the design process in creating an interface that doesn't have the, these kind of problems in the end. So for example, one very famous design framework was this called user-centered design. We will be more or less following not the exact procedures, but the, the spirit of this uh, UCD process. Um, in user-centered design, the basic idea is that the users, real users, should be involved in the design of the system since the beginning and throughout all design steps. So instead of building a system in your room and when it's finished, give it to the user, you bring the user in on day one when you're, st when you're still thinking about what you want to build. And then you work with the users, we try to understand what they need you do a prototype and you let the user see the prototype or see your sketches about the ideas you have and get feedback from them. So basically the users will be part of your design process during each phase of the design process. Of course, users are not programmers, so you cannot just talk to them or walk with the code to them or expect them to understand what you are. We need tools, practical tools, methods of work for which we can understand what the users want. We can understand where the users find the difficulties. 
whether the user understands correctly what we had in mind when we designed the, the interface and so on. Uh, so this means that, uh, and we will see in the different labs, uh, at different stages, at different steps in our design process, we should involve a group of users. And at different steps, we should use different techniques for them. So when we are just designing the idea or understanding the goals, uh, we need to do a, a something which is just extracting the needs from them. Of course, you cannot stop a person in the street and say, what do you want? Money. No. Um, OK, you, you need to do some kind of interview, some kind of observation, we'll, we'll study those. And then later on, we'll, you'll build some sketches, some ideas, uh, and you need to check them with the users. But of course, you won't ask them, do you like it? Because the, the answer would, be not, would mean nothing to you. They are not experts in interfaces, they are not experts in evaluation. They cannot imagine what it will be, the finished finish product from, from an initial sketch. So we will learn some techniques that are used and of course, we, we should plan to be able to involve groups of users in our design process. Real users, actual users, or potential users. So if you are building an application for gardeners, then you need to involve a group of gardeners. Not uh, maybe people that, wor that work in a shop, in a gardening shop, because they are just a different job. So always finding a group of users that would be as, as close as possible to the actual target users. As close as possible. And then involve them in small groups in your evaluations. It's not something that costs a lot of time in your process. Maybe you have a development process of three or six months. So we are talking about five or ten days at most. No, less than 10 days, or work with users throughout all the design process. So it doesn't add complexity or length. It will add quality and understanding of your user base that six months before you go into the market instead of three days after you go into the market. That would be a disaster. Hmm? Understanding the users only after you launch the product is not something everybody would want to do. Um, on the general principle of user-centered design, there was other design framework that were developed uh, more recently. Um, participation, participatory design and evolution of UCD, where actually a group of users will be co-designers of the system. So it will be even more involved. Uh, um, and you work uh, with groups uh, to design together the application, at least in the first steps, at least. So then we, when you, of course, start implementation and programming, it would be less uh, useful to have the user sitting there with you. But at least uh, at the initial phases, we have uh, um, weekly meetings or days uh, working with the users together, not just doing interviews. So we are on one side of the desk and you are on the other side but uh, really working together on the, ta on the design table and, uh, and arranging things, arranging ideas. Um, of course, uh, all these ideas uh, should be applicable also to modern uh, software devel development methodologies like the um, agile methods. And actually, they, they fit quite well because in many agile methods, you have an incremental development uh, of the application. So at every step, step, at every iteration, you always have a working system. And then you plan for the next iteration and so on. And uh, having already a working system will allow us to do early usability evaluation on that portion of the system, getting feedback to correct problems for the next iteration, and also maybe steering the development uh, direction also for the new features. Okay, we knew that in the first three features, uh, do we have this problem that was uh, recurrent, were consistent, so then for the next ones we will design it in a different way so that we will learn to avoid uh, these mistakes. Hmm? So, uh, of course, the, 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 the techniques uh, are slightly different, uh, but uh, uh, the idea is always the same. Okay? 
in the different stages of development, uh, whether you have a waterfall order development model with the specification and then implementation and then testing and so on, or in agile method where you are incrementally developing uh, by feature addition, just remember that at every, at every iteration, at every uh, step, uh, try to involve uh, some, some users to ensure that, uh, um, that you are building the right system. Um, finally, because then we have to go to the lab, um, I just wanted to, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, to, to discuss uh, some of the attributes uh, of usability. So usability is a very broad word, word uh, and concept. What should we look into a system to decide whether it's uh, usable or not, more or less? Usefulness. We already mentioned that. Does it do something that people really want? Learnability. Is it easy to learn? Remember the reaction that you have when you open a new website uh, if you don't understand in the first uh, one or two seconds maximum how it works, uh, you will close it. You have no time to fight against uh, the interface. Something to take in, by design, something should take uh, more effort to learn because maybe it's something more technical or more complex, but in general, uh, learnability should help the user learn new functions. Learnability talks about the first impact with the system. And then memor memorability is that once you learned how to use it, it's easy to remember it. So when, uh, you know the impression when you, use, you, do, you did something, maybe you, know, you do the categorical didactic once a year. On the next year, when it's September, you start to sweating because you remember you did something last year but it's not, you don't really remember. You knew it, you, you got through, okay? You did it. But how? I, I learned it last year, and then I forgot. I, I come here, I don't remember how I did it, okay? Uh, you know you, you are able to do it, but you don't remember how, because what you learned didn't stick. It didn't stick because, A, it was not so obvious, and B, because you, don't, you, are, you are not a frequent user of the system. Effectiveness, uh, of course, uh, does it really allow you to reach the goal? Okay, so it may be useful. It does it do something that you want, but, it's so, but at the end, I don't get the, to the goal because I'm lost in the middle. So after playing with the... If... Uh, any of you did the speed at the Poste Italiana, you know that uh, you are doing that, but you are never sure it works, uh, and at the end, uh, you abandon it. Um, efficiency is one dimension, of course. Uh, clicking and waiting breaks, breaks the flow of interaction, and so it makes you lose uh, the context of interaction. If it's too slow, then you find yourself saying, what, 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 what was I doing before? And so efficiency is just, uh, it's, a, it's a good from the, say, programming point of view. But here, efficiency is for maintaining the flow of information. Like when you're talking to a person and they take too much time to respond, uh, and uh, the, the, the efficiency of the, or the, or the interaction will be lower. Visibility of the system state, we already mentioned that and we'll test it much, much more in the following weeks. Uh, so the user should always be aware of what the system knows and what the system does and what the system just did and what the system is expected you to do, is expecting you to do, and so on. Errors should be few and easily recoverable. It's another how the system prevents errors or lets you correct errors. It's another important, very important dimension of usability. You know that when you're, when you're writing an application, the error checking is mostly more than half of the code that you write. 
doing all the checks, the validation, the corrections, it's a mess. It's, uh, everybody hates it, except the users. Uh, and finally, it should be maybe also nice to use. It shouldn't be you know, desperate when you are and when you need to open that application. I know it's a nightmare. I have to do that because it's mandatory, but it's not uh, satisfying. It's not fun. It's not uh, okay. Not everybody should be fun like a video game, but at least it shouldn't be mm, too complex or too difficult to use. And uh, this is summed up uh, by this uh, don't make me think uh, sentence that I think. Uh, I think this should be the main message for this morning. Uh, a user, at a glance, this user will see the interface and immediately understands what each part of the interface is doing. What's the part of each part of the interface and what it can do, where can it click uh, on this page. It takes less than five, six milliseconds, 600 millise uh, milliseconds. Less than one second. In less than one second, you already have the clear picture of what is information and what are your options on this page, this or a well-designed page. And if you keep this time, then it will become unconscious. You don't feel like you are studying the page. You don't feel like you are reasoning about what you, you, you want to do with the page with interface in general. That's the goal. Otherwise, uh, you are just stop there and ask yourself some questions. OK, what is this? Why is this uh, in a different style than the other one? Uh, should I start here or there or whatever? If you start asking yourself questions, you, it's because there's an ambiguity in presentation and there's an ambiguity in execution. So minimizing the number of question, or question marks that are in your mind that will slow your thinking, that will uh, distract you for your main goal, that will break the flow of information. So minimizing the number of question marks uh, down to zero, hopefully, is the goal of our um, ACI design. OK, I stop here. And uh, so we can gather our stuff and walk uh, for those that are enrolled in the first uh, uh, slot of the lab and walk together. So we need uh, uh, to cross the street uh, and enter by Costa Castel Fidardo 39. When we are there, we climb to the second floor. OK? But you follow me, because I am the only one that can open the door. OK?